oh, what is John Gruden and Mike Mayock doing? I don't understand it. They don't know how to draft. What are they doing? Why are they doing this? I don't even understand. Psych, did I get you? What's happening? What's going on? My name's G Sling. I'm doing my thing, and I hope you are as well. And I have some strong opinions about this uh, Raiders draft, and I actually think they did a decent job overall. And we'll get into the discussion of this because I know that John Gruden and Mike Mayock are getting some flack for what they've been doing with this guy over here, Alex Leatherwood. But we'll discuss that here in a second. However, overall, I think they did a good job in this draft. So let's go over some of this and let's get chalk talking and talk about this team and how the roster's looking. And we'll also break some things down schematically and all that good jazz and get some take key takeaways from what they've been able to do. Let's start off, though, with the draft picks. And it starts with Alex Leatherwood, who they took at 17. Let's get the... Uh, the elephant or the the raider and you know the elephant in the room. I better watch out for the elephants again here in my room. Hopefully no elephants out here. Even though well, I like elephants too. I think it'd be cool. I see people with elephants out there in real life, and you know I see them with exotic animals. It'd be a fun exotic animal to have. Or I'd probably go with a lion, but I think an elephant would be really cool. But nonetheless, let's get back to this. No more uh, exotic animal talk. Alex Leatherwood is going to be the person they took here at 17 and. Maybe there's also things that we don't know behind the scenes with Christian Derisaw. There's a reason why people fall in the draft, and there are things that GMs and these organizations know that we don't know just because we have these film evaluations and the, the analytics and all that jazz. You know, you see stuff like that, but you, you don't actually know with the interviews. And then, you know, of course, medically, there were some things I heard from Christian Derisaw. So there can be things that the reasons why players drop. It's just that simple. Now, sometimes it's warranted, sometimes it's not. In this case, I don't know. We don't know exactly the, the whole ordeal and what happened there, but we can say Minnesota got a great pick. We don't know yet. It's going to be time will tell sort of situation. However, let's get on to Alex Leatherwood and discuss how he fits here. And ultimately, he's going to be this team's starting day one right tackle. And, you know, they seem to go after, they have a, a, a type that they go after these three to four big time school starters and whatnot. But with Alex Leatherwood, he was this type of prospect that, he garnered this, you know, this top 15 level of talent going into the season as a top 15 pick. And people kind of, you know, got on the film and really hit him hard, especially after that senior bowl and getting beat by Quincy Ruche. He really got excruciated for that. And people kind of took that out of proportion. But if you go back onto the film and watch his film breakdown and things like that, He's actually, he was very, very solid. And he's very technically sound. I know he's coming from Alabama and they have a really good offensive line in general and they're good, they're well coached. Nick Saban and that offensive line, they, they do a good job, right? And it is always helpful when you have a good surrounding core with you. But let's take that out of context and look at what Alex Leatherwood was just on an island at that left tackle position. He was good. And yes, you have a problem. He, he opens up his feet quite, or he, um, he opens his hips too quickly. But that's something that can be fixed. Colton Miller had a bit of a problem. Well, Colton Miller also had a balance problem. That was a big thing. But this coaching staff he's going over with, with John Gruden, they've consistently shown that they can develop these guys. They find, they find these offensive linemen. They're able to develop them. And I really trust the staff to be able to develop Alex Leatherwood. And it's not that he is a project or nothing. I do think he can come in day one and start. I don't think he's going to be amazing day one. But I think he'll be a good tackle to pair along with, Al with uh, Colton Miller. Pardon me there uh, with Colton Miller. So I think it's going to be a really good tackle combination. So I'm not as worried about Alex Leatherwood. And I think he's got perfect scheme fit in what they're going to be looking for here in this offense uh, with this power and what they're going to be able to do here. So I like Alex Leatherwood. I think he's a really good pick for them. Ultimately, was it a reach? Yes, it was a reach. Okay. I would have liked him at 27, not 17. But with that being said, they took their guy. You do what you can. You don't risk trading down. I know, I guess the Ravens worth blowing smoke or whatever. I don't know if that's true, but I think the Ravens actually would have taken him at 27. That's my opinion. I think the Ravens really would have. Let's keep it going though. Trayvon Morig, and we'll talk about the offense in, in a little bit and how it's, how everything fits in, but uh, Trayvon Morig is the pick here in the second round. And yeah, this was a big time steal. So you kind of, people were even saying, hey, if you flip these two picks, it would have been really, really good. But nonetheless, it doesn't matter. Trayvon Morig here, the, you know, obviously consensus top safety. I didn't have him as my top safety, but I do think he is a very good safety. So you're being able to get this guy who's going to be able to come in um, and be this single high safety in Gus Bradley's uh, system. So with that being said, you'll be able to get yourself a single high safety. 
I mean, he can do a, a multitude of things, but I think he's going to be playing a lot of that role for sure. And they'll be playing other things than just cover three for sure or nothing like that. But they'll also do mix in quarters. I see this team playing some quarters for sure. But Trayvon Moore can do both of those things really, really well. And I think he's going to be a perfect day one fit for them. Perfect day one starter as well. So you get Malcolm Kuntz here in the third round. And actually, going back and watching more film on Malcolm Kuntz, I do think he is a little bit underrated in terms of where I was on him going into the draft because I didn't really do... I only watched like two games of his, to be honest. I watched the Ball State game and then also the Bowl game where he had a couple sacks in there. But uh, nonetheless... He's a guy who's going to be able to come off the edge, and basically he's going to be a guy who can replace Arden Key, which was just a disaster there. Now that he's gone, you need someone there to be able to be a rotation piece with Yannick Ngakwe and be able to come off that edge. And I think Malcolm Kuntz could see, I mean, I don't think he's going to see a huge role in year number one, but I do think he's going to see a nice rotation role. So you got Malcolm Kuntz, who definitely is going to be that guy who's going to be able to come off the edge there with some speed. He also does have some power, super long arms, too. He's got really long arms. And uh, yeah, he's definitely a guy to keep an eye out on there. Really, really solid player. Probably, again, the best edge rusher coming out of Buffalo since Khalil Mack. And of course, you know, the Raiders go out and get him there. So they're trying to make up for that, I guess. I don't know. On to their second, third round pick at number 80. They took De Divine Diablo. Maybe one of the coolest names in the draft. But Divine Diablo, man, that is such a cool name. But they took the dude from Virginia Tech here. And I'm guessing he's going to be playing a lot of linebacker, sub-linebacker. I don't really think he's going to be playing up top or nothing. Now, he can play up there, but I think from his ability as a tackler and what he is, because he, he's really a tackling machine, he's going to be able to come in day one and be a great sub-linebacker and be able to play kind of that hybrid uh, role, whether it's dime packages or um, you know, in the nickel or whatever is going to be playing a lot of hybrid role there. So I like Divine Diablo and how he's going to be able to fit in this defense too and, and uh, how they're going to rotate it in. You know, of course, you got your your deep your deep corners here who may be playing the cover three if we're putting it out there. And of course, you got your single high safety. And then you're going to have a couple of two guys where I think you're going to have safeties, whether it's, um, of course, Jonathan Abramley playing in the box as a blitzer or just underneath coverage. I think that'll be a strong point. But you also are going to have, you know, this other area on this. I mean, I think Carl Joseph's going to be your day one starter also there. But nonetheless, Divine Diablo is going to be able to work in, in a hybrid package on that line for sure, or that, the linebacking core. You got Tyree Glefsey, who to me is going to be good depth for Jonathan Abram and, and kind of a backup insurance plan. So if Jonathan Abram really does have another bad season or something like that, or just not working out, you don't want to re-sign him. Tyree Gillespie is a guy who I think can absolutely ball out for you as that guy who can play that box role. And he's really, really good in run support as well. So Tyree Gillespie is kind of a missile heading downhill. He, you saw it in that Alabama game, dude. He had some really, really nice tackles. And that's what you're bringing here to this Raiders defense. And then we are rounding out with a couple of picks I really like as well. I mean, I like Tyree Gillespie a lot too. He was kind of one of those guys I was really high on as well. But Nate Hobbs, I like this dude coming out of Illinois, dude. I think he's underrated. And you're being able to get him in the fifth round. I think that's a steal, to be honest. He's a guy that can come in here and play that boundary corner role. Now, he may be starting in the slot early on. They may try to get him in that role early. But I would imagine he's going to be a guy they look to develop on a practice squad or just, you know, as depth for the first season. I don't expect him to play a whole ton year number one. But I do like him for the long term of this team as a guy that really could work out. I think that he's a really, really interesting pick. And if you're looking at corners later in the draft, I think he was a really good one to take. So I like his band of athleticism and what he's going to be able to bring into this defense. Lastly, though, they get Jimmy Morrissey, another dude that I was kind of high on too as well. I, I really do like this guy. He's another, you know, what, four-year starter from Pittsburgh. And he was, you know, another team captain there. Just a real big-time leader at that center position. Yeah, his play strength was a little concerning at Pittsburgh. But other than that, like, he is a really, really solid player. And if he puts on a little bit of play strength, like, he can be a legit center. Like, he's a good backup piece to Andre James. I know you got Nick Martin, too, who they picked up. I don't know if they're going to keep him on the roster. He might be waived depending on final cuts and all that. But uh, Jimmy Morrissey, to me, is a guy that I really do like. And I think that if you give him a shot, just he's not ready year number one or nothing like that. And, and that's fine. Like, uh, you know, the team is raving about Andre James and how he's going to be a day one starter for them at center. And there's a reason why they, they let go of Ronnie Hudson. So you get Jimmy Morrissey in the seventh round as a development style offensive lineman. And I like the pick there. So that's kind of rounding out your draft picks. Now let's take a look at how this roster is looking heading into the season currently right now in terms of how the, it's constructed and what they're going to be trying to do. So first off, starting with the offense, uh, this reworked offensive line. So let's let's talk about the reworked offensive line first. 
And of course, you got Colton Miller still here on your left side, protecting Derek Carr in that blind side. And you've seen him get better and better over each season. He started out as one of the worst left tackles in the league. He's proven to be one of the better left tackles now in the league. I mean, he's not there yet, but he has shown flashes now over this past season, doing very, very well in pass protection and keeping Derek Carr uh, you know, up right there in that left position on that blind side role. So I like Cole Miller going into year number four now after getting that nice big contract. He's the guy that has made some really nice headways. And then Alex Leatherwood at right tackle coming in here from Alabama, of course, as their top draft selection the controversial pick, but he's coming in at that right tackle position. You got Brandon Parker as some depth there as well, but I think that is a good, solid tackle group day one, and this this group's going to be really good in terms of bringing more power and oomph to that that run game as well. You know, that's another thing that you point out with this offensive line, and you can say what you want about Trent Brown, but he was injured a ton, man, and availability is huge, and bringing in Alex Leatherwood, hopefully that sort of solves some issues they just need, they need availability, man. It's going to help Josh Jacobs out a lot. It's going to help Kenyon Drake out a lot, which I think is going to be a really good one-two punch, by the way. We'll talk about that in a second. But this offensive line is looking, in my opinion, actually looking better than last year. You bring a lot of youth into the, to the mix with Miller, James, and Leatherwood. Now, you know, you got John Simpson. Hopefully, he's going to be a guy who can step up. Another dude from Clemson this past year they drafted. But John Simpson is going to be a guy I'm sure they look at long term on that uh, that that uh, that guard position. Part of my my Porky Pig impersonation there. But you also got Denzel Good, who's still there, as well as Richie Incognito. So you figure on maybe again you got injuries there, but you got John Simpson as depth piece there, Lester Cotton as well. So your reworked offensive line is looking, I think it's looking better. I think it's looking decent. I do think there's going to be some early headwind struggles for sure. But ultimately, if Andre James can kind of be that what they're seeing in practice, this offensive line could be a legit 15 borderline average offense that could develop into a much better offense as the season progresses on. And of course, injuries are huge, right? With any offensive line, you got to stay healthy. I mean, continuity is huge on an offensive line. Uh, besides that, they pick up uh, Darvery, uh, Devery Hamil Hamilton from Duke. So they take up another death piece tackle. He can play a bit over there. So, you know, just we'll see if he ends up making the team or whatnot. But he's another guy can uh, compete. So Derveny, uh Hamilton can be a guy there. They keep on that roster and then we'll see. But then we're talking about Jimmy Morrissey. Uh, Nick Martin, we'll see if he makes the team. But he's a guy there. And I think Nick Martin will depend on Andre James. So if, if Andre James looks really well, I would expect Nick Martin to get cut. And then they just keep Jimmy Morrissey as that backup center, that development center. Or they can move Jimmy to the practice squad, whatever, from there. So that's how I'm seeing the offensive line looking better, I think, in terms of long-term and longevity of this group. And maybe more of a powerhouse helping this run game for sure there. And then uh, running back position here, as we were talking about earlier, I actually think Josh Jacobs, if you're looking at fantasy, man, he's going to like the fourth round which to me is a steal. I'm not that worried about Kenyon Drake. I think he's going to be a good, it's going to be a good one-two punch. I still think Josh Jacobs, even if you look at what the past year with Devontae Booker, who still got over 100 touches this past season, um, you know, I still think Josh Jacobs is the lead back. I'm not worried about that. I think he's going to be have a featured role. Now, it could be a little inconsistent like it's been, but He's a guy that he's still proven to be over 1,000 yards each and every season. What do you have, over 1,300 yards from scrimmage this past year? I'm blanking on that number. Don't quote me on that, but it was something like that, okay? He had over 1,000 yards, again, rushing, and then, again, receiving-wise, I believe it was over 1,300 yards. So Josh Jacobs is still a really good back. He's going to get goal line work. You know, it just really can he stay healthy, right? The really the big thing with him is can he play a full season? That's really been the thing that's been his problem. He just can't play a full season and injuries, but... I think it's a great one-two punch, and I think Josh Jacobs is a steal in fantasy. So keep an eye on Josh Jacobs. If you're looking for running back in that fourth round range, I think he's a steal. Uh, enough fantasy for right now. We'll talk about that another day at receiver. I think these are your five guys that are really going to be your five guys, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, we got our five guys that I think are going to be your main starting receivers and then rotation and whatnot. So Henry Ruggs, they're going to ask a lot, I would imagine, out of him in this second year. So we'll see how Greg Olson's going to be and John Gruden's going to be able to get the most out of him, but they need to, okay? They really need him to step up and take that next leap because he's going to be a big part of this offense. And then you got uh, John Brown, of course, they bring in from Buffalo. And then Willie Sneed as well from the Ravens, who's going to be 
uh, hybrid, you know, uh, or, you know, rotation role with Hunter Renfro, who I think Hunter Renfro is going to be starting here in the slot, but it depends obviously on the pack and what they want to do, but you got a good one-two punch there in the slot, just depending on course on formations. They could both could be out there, but Hunter Renfro and Lil, Will, uh, Willie Sneed, so that's a good combination there. And then Brian Edwards, obviously second year coming out of South Carolina, and Jay, Zay Jones. So I think those are your, kind of your rotation of guys there. I guess that's six receivers, but I think those are your main starting receivers. I mean, I guess you could work in Trey Quinn. They pick up DJ Turner and Dylan Stoner Stoner from Oklahoma State and then DJ Turner from Pittsburgh. Turner had some big games there from Pittsburgh, but uh, that Virginia Tech game, he had a really nice one and a couple of games there. But nonetheless, I don't know. I didn't really see a whole ton. I just don't know if he has the speed to be able to create enough separation there on the outside. But we'll have to wait and see. He's another guy he can play. In, I mean, he mainly played in the slot anyway. And then Dylan Stoner from Oklahoma State, which isn't a huge fan of his, but you never know, right? You never know. Again, a lot of these guys, it just depends on the right scheme and everything like that. They can play, they, you know, they can be good players. So that's kind of your receiving core and how it's looking. As we we're talking about, I think those five guys, your offensive line, and of course, you know, the tight end group's looking great. Darren Waller is one of the best tight ends in the league. I definitely put him right there behind George Kittle and Travis Kelsey. And then you got Foster Monroe as a good backup tight end there as well. Derek Carrier. They pick up Carson Williams, the former basketball player from Western Kentucky. So he's an interesting one, dude. This dude can ball out. I watched some basketball highlight, man. That dude. He might be interested. Again, just like Darren Wall. I mean, you're getting these former basketball players out here. Maybe he's a guy that look you look down the line. He's going to be a practice squad guy early on, but maybe in a couple of years, you never know, right? Those are the type of guys you take a chance on and you develop over a couple of years and you kind of watch out for. Matt Bushman, unfortunately, that injury, that Achilles, I believe it was Achilles. He's still recovering from that, but he's a guy that, you know, was really good there for BYU. Just got to get healthy. A little bit on the older side, but he's a guy there we'll have to keep an eye out on. And then running back, you pick up a couple of UDFA guys as well with Trey Regis from Louisiana Raging Cajuns. They've proven out to be, uh, you know, ranking out some good players over these past years. So you got Trey Regis, really good runner. He just, you know, you got to wonder about the speed, but I'm not as worried about it, man. Dude's a good runner. So don't be surprised if he's a steal in terms of free agent, you know, UDFA pickup. And then Garrett Groshek. I love Garrett Groshek coming out of Wisconsin. The reunion with Alex Ingold. I love it, man. They got the two fullback combinations, so that's going to be fun to watch. But he's one of these guys, man. Just a, a great, I don't know. He's got a certain play style to him, but he's just a straight up like one cut. He just smashes through a hole and he bursts, man. He's got some bursts. So I like it. I think their running back group is really, really good. I think his offense is fine. Now, ultimately, did they take a step? No. I think they're going to be relying a lot on Derek Carr for sure. But he had a good season last year, and Derek Carr was not the problem. The problem really was on the defense. But Derek Carr was a good quarterback last year. And I think, you know, they didn't they didn't do a whole ton in terms of the weaponry. Now you're just figuring on with progression and whatnot. Hopefully they get better and everything like that with Henry Ruggs and Brian Edwards taking those next steps. And Hunter Renfro, of course, getting some more experience as well. And then this offensive line is going to be that big question mark. How do they gel early on in the season? I think that's going to be the big question mark for this team. But overall, I think it's a good offense. You know, I would put them in that 10 to 15 range right now with upside potentially depending on this offensive line. On to the defense side of the ball where this was the really the big question because they were like ranked in the bottom five in defense of like all defensive categories for the most part. And what did they do? They went out and addressed it. They went out heavy on this defense, right? Besides that first pick that they got at 17, they like got all defensive players except for Jimmy Morrissey, right? And then they also picked up some guys in UDFA. But let's take a look how this defense is going to be looking because they also picked up free agents, of course, for sure. But you got Casey Hayward and you got Trayvon Moore. We'll start at corner, right? And we'll start out with these two guys on the outside who are who we're going to project as the starting outside corner. I think Casey Award and Trayvon Mollig are going to be your two starters there on the outside. Damian Rant, of course, could be that slot corner. And, you know, he can work into an outside role for sure too. But I know they are wanting to see a lot more from Damian Arnett this year. They put a lot of pressure on both of, on both of these guys because they're going to need him to step up, man. They've, they've spent high draft capital on, on these guys and they're going to need some better play for sure. So we'll see. But Damian Arnett with going into a full off season, we'll see how he does. Remember, there was a short off season, uh, COVID. There were a lot of things with Damian Arnett. And it was a reach. He just wasn't ready to be a day one starter like where they took him. It was definitely a reach. But overall... What you have going into this this now, this year, I think is way, way better. Plus, fighting for that fourth spot right now is Nevin Lawson, who unfortunately has got a two-game suspension after the, the substance abuse, whatever, policy thing. He's going to get suspended for that, so it is what it is. But, uh, you know, he's, he's going to be a guy competing. I don't know if they'll cut him, but I would imagine they keep Rajul Douglas or Nevin Lawson. They could keep both, though. But I think both of those guys are going to be fighting for that fourth backup 
position role right there at corner. I like both of them, though. I think Rajul Douglas is a good pickup there from Carolina. So maybe an underrated signing. I think he can come in and play in a pinch, and he's not bad. So, you know, he's not a great corner or nothing like that, but he can come in in a pinch, and he's not going to be a liability. So being able to have those two guys there I think is good uh, day one position there as a backup cornerback role. You got Amik Robinson, who they drafted this past year, another Ragin, but uh, you got... Uh, T.J. Morrison, you got Nate Hobbs, as we were talking about earlier, who they drafted from Illinois. I'm super psyched up to see in a couple years, maybe as a guy who can be a you know potential uh, starter for this team. You never know, but I think he's going to be a guy that could contribute uh, later down the line for this team. So uh, T.J. Morrison was uh, from uh, where was he from? Stony Brook, something like that. I think he's from Stony Brook, but uh, he was a guy who played a bit of hybrid there in corner and also at safety. So he played a bit in the slot and then up top too. He kind of transitioned his role. But maybe we'll see if he makes the team or not, whatnot. So that's your cornerback situation. As we're talking about, I think Mullen, Hayward, and Arnett are going to be your full-time starters there. And then Rajul Douglas and Nevin Lawson are going to be your rotation guys. And maybe Army can work into that rotation in the slot. Nate Hobbs, look down the line into the future there. On to the uh, safety group, where they've had a ton of safeties, man. Uh, Trayvon Morico, of course, adding him in the second round as this full-time, I would imagine, this deep middle third safety in this Gus Bradley system. I'm guessing that's what he's going to be, you know, that that's what they're envisioning with this role, and I like it. So I think you got him, you got Jonathan Abram, who's going to be playing that box, uh, blitzing, you know, playing underneath coverage, kit him towards that line of scrimmage. That's really where he was at his best, and that's where he actually looked really good. He's a playmaker, dude, and I mean, he, he has an incredible acceleration in getting after players. Uh, so he can make a lot of big time plays up at the line of scrimmage. So I like him in that role. I think he'll be a lot better. And then Tyree Gillespie will be a good death piece to have as a backup there. And if nothing else, he'll be a great special teamer too, in my opinion. Um, other than that though, you got Carl Joseph on the other, you know, here we have on the other side, but he'll be playing again, probably in that hybrid role. He'll work into the free safety role. He might even be starting day one as your free safety and they'll work Trayvon Molik more, more into that role as, you know, it goes along into the season. But overall, we'll have to wait and see. But I would expect Carl Joseph, Trayvon Morig, Jonathan Abram, and Tyree Gillespie to be your main four players at that safety position. Jeff Heath could be have a role there. But I think those are your main four guys that you're going to see this season. Again, Jeff, Jeff Heath too, but uh, just because of that experience and everything. Other than that, uh, some guys who could get cut, maybe Dalen or Rashawn. I don't know. We'll see how that works out for roster positions. You also got Sean Crawford who they uh, picked up UDFA market from Notre Dame. He was another dude who hybrid, or transitioned from corner as well there. Uh, he just dealt with a lot of injuries, to be honest with you, from Notre Dame. So just kind of guy, you know, we didn't see a whole ton of. But when he did play, he looked pretty good. So he's a guy to keep an eye out on, maybe as a, a guy who could, you know, compete and work his way up on the practice squad. So that's kind of something to keep an eye out on. Now, onto the linebacking core. And uh, they got a lot of depth here at this linebacking core. As we were talking about, they bring in Divine Diablo, and I would imagine he's going to be playing that kind of that linebacker role. And, uh, you know, along with, of course, Corey Littleton, Nick Wachowski, Nicholas Morrow. I'm assuming those are going to be your kind of your four rotation guys. Now, Tanner Muse has that high draft capital in the third year. We'll see if he can kind of break out. He dealt with injuries and things like that that first year. But he's a guy that could be looking into potentially getting, you know, them trying to at least see if they can get him to somewhat of a role. And then Jarvin White, another dude, the UNLV kid that was, you know, coming out there. He was stud there from UNLV and he came in and he's impressed this this coaching staff. I know they've been raving and raving about him and going crazy about him saying some good things. So he's another guy to keep an eye out on into this this year in the second year. Maybe he's a guy that gets a role. You never know, right? But you got to figure on that they may they may be fighting for this roster position. I don't know how many linebackers they're going to carry. I, I would assume they can carry all six here, but they may only want to carry five. You also got Max Richardson from Boston College. We'll see if he can compete for a roster spot. But uh, what I would guess is you know could be you know a situation where maybe they trade Tanner Muse. I don't know, or maybe they. I don't know. Maybe there's a situation there where they work something out. But I think they could keep all six of those guys there. Wouldn't surprise me. But uh, just, you know, hey, you never know what will happen. But ultimately, I like the linebacking core. I think it's it, look, it looks a lot, lot better than it did this past season. It should be in a good position, at least. On to the defensive line here. Final thing on this defense and how it's looking. We got Neonic Ngakwe. You got Max Crosby, of course. Max the Axe. You got Mad Max on the edge there with Yannick Ngakwe. So I think it's a good Solid group there. It looks, you know, better. Of course, you got Malcolm Kuntz, who will be a rotation 
And, of course, Cleveland Farrell, too, will be a rotation on the edge. They have him listed here at this interior defense line spot. But he did play very well at that interior defense line spot. And he was even saying he liked playing that interior defense line spot. And from everything that I've heard that Gus Bradley and this defense, they want him to be playing. I mean, they, I think they want to play him on that interior. So I think they're going to see, you're going to see him play a good amount from that spot. Now, not all the time, but I would imagine he gets a role there. So that's going to be something to kind of keep an eye out on um, with that. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's just something, you know, you can kind of look at there. But Jonathan Hankins is going to be probably a starter day one. He's really been their most consistent defensive tackle, really, from a, you know, run standpoint. And just, you know, he's not really a great pass rusher or nothing like that, but he's just a really solid defensive lineman here. And I think he's going to be your day one starter, maybe Solomon Thomas as well, you know, just depending on packages and where they want to play Cleveland Furl, right? It just depends, of course. Maybe you got Yannick Ngakwe, Cleveland Furl on the edges on one play, and then you got uh, Jonathan Hankins and Solomon Thomas or David Irvin. Uh, Kendall Vickers can play a little bit edge. He can, you know, so you got different rotations, different roles that are going to be played in this defensive line. So it's not really just cut and dry, of course, you know, on who's playing where because they're going to rotate these guys. Uh, Kendall Vickers, as we're saying, can play on the edge a little bit on strong side. He can also play interior. Uh, you know, David Irvin's probably going to be an interior guy there. Don't see him on the edge too much there. Darius Stills, who they pick up from West Virginia. You got Matt Dickerson. We'll see if he makes the roster. He could be a cap, or not a cap casualty, but just someone they cut. You pick up Quentin Jefferson from Buffalo there. Uh, as another guy on that defensive line. So defensive line is definitely looking better than it did last year. Now, ultimately, I still don't understand why they cut Maurice Hurst. Maybe they do feel confident enough with Solomon Thomas and then Cleveland Furl is playing on the inside and maybe they're just saying, hey, we're a bit redundant there with what we have. We need, you know, we needed something a little bit different. So we didn't really need him. Now, granted, I would have traded Maurice Hurst because I think he at least had some sort of trade value, but it is what it is. And that's what they ended up doing. So it was kind of a questionable move in my opinion, but maybe they saw something in practice they didn't like or whatever, who knows. But I thought so. I mean, I thought... Uh, you know, he's a good player. So, I mean, it's just like, I don't I don't know. I don't know what they saw Maurice Hurst. Uh, the 49ers get a steal, in my opinion. But that's not what this is about. The defensive line is still looking better, nonetheless. I think with the additions here of Malcolm Kuntz, Yannick Ngakwe, Cleveland Furrow playing on the inside, for sure, on a rotational role. But, yeah, I think it's a better group. And Carl Nassib, another guy here, is a rotation piece on that group there. Uh, we'll see if he, you know, I've heard rumors that they wanted to let him go or whatever, but I don't think they're going to let him go. So that's your roster now. And let's take a look at some key takeaways now for the wrap it all up. And uh, yeah, they took safeties, man. They took three of them. Now I know Divine Diablo, you could say, well, he's going to be more of a linebacker. And that's probably true. But nonetheless, they went after a lot of safeties. They picked them up in UDFA market. They really tried to shore up the secondary and make sure that these guys are going to fit into Gus Bradley's new system here. And I think they did a great job with it. So ultimately, I got to give John Gruden and Mike Mayock some praise there because I think that they, they certainly took swings at it. Now, we'll see if the players pan out. That ultimately, you know, takes coaching staff and development and things like that. But I think this coaching staff is really good. They've proven to be able to develop players. They just haven't really gotten the talent. And that's been the problem with this team is they just, you know, they've taken players and whatnot. But I think this year they've got some serious talent. And I think that it's going to be a fun one to watch. But uh, Trayvon Moore, I think, could be a, a you know a serious star for this defense this next season. And, and I think this defense will be a borderline 15 defense. I think they're going to get back to average on this defense, which is what they need. And I think it could be a playoff team if they get back to average. And as we were saying, prioritize defense. I mean, they spent uh, most of their picks on defense. Besides the first and last pick, I mean, they spent it all on defense. So they definitely prioritized it. And then, you know, the reworked offensive line is certainly going to be a question mark with this team. How is everything going to look? Like, what you know, is it going to look like day one? Because, you know, there's a lot of continuity questions there with any offensive line. It's always a little bit tricky when you got new players coming in, but it is something that they have, you have to do, right? You have to do long-term and they did it. So we'll have to wait and see how that pans out, but it's definitely a situation that uh, we'll have to monitor there. And then my favorite picks, I love Jimmy Morrissey here at the end of the draft on the offense. I know they only have two selections to pick from, and I just didn't want to go with the first pick just because, you know, we got to change it up here. We went with Jimmy Morrissey, so I like that pick quite a bit as a depth center. He may not make the team, I don't know, but uh, if nothing else, he's a good guy, you know, got to keep an eye out on. And then defense, Trayvon Moore, I think is just such a good value. This was tough one they had some good defensive picks I, I do think they had some good ones but Trayvon Morg here is just a great value I mean at 43 I thought he was going to go maybe even the back end of the first round so getting Trayvon Morg at 43 I think is a really really good value and 
uh, makes up for any sort of reach there on Alex Leatherwood. Finally, UDFA, I love Garrett Groshek. I just love his play style, man. He's just fun to go watch. You just go watch him, man. He's just fun to watch. So I had to put him there. I, I'm not really a, too familiar with a lot of the UDFA pickups that they got. So I uh, just, you know, hey, Garrett Groshek was a guy I knew and I liked and, you know, just thought it was fun. So anyway, final draft grade is going to be a B for me. I think they did a good job. Like overall, I think they did a good job. Now, you know, yeah, a little bit of reach there, but you know, it is what it is. You make some, you know, moves, you do some things, you do what you got to do. I think ultimately they did a good job, especially getting Malcolm Kuntz there in the third round. Divine Diablo is a talented player, just you know, again, be a really good tackling machine. Tyreek Gillespie is a really good player. Nate Hobbs, I think, could be a guy. Yeah, not not Hobbs from Fast and Furious, even though we got to watch out for The Rock. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's crazy, crazy. Jason Statham out here coming crazy. But anyway, I think, they're again, they're making another one here soon. When is it coming? I don't know when it's coming out, but it'll be interesting. They get so futuristic with these. But finally, you know, they got Jimmy Morrissey with that last pick. Overall, I think they did a good job. So that's just my opinion. I think they did a better job than people are talking about. And I do think this team can be a playoff team. I know how tough it's going to be. This division is going to be a challenge, but I think they certainly can do it. If Derek Carr is plays like he did last year, I think with the improvements on defense and Gus Bradley coming in as your defense coordinator, I do think this team can make its way to the playoffs. So I'm going to wrap it up there, and I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope everybody has a great day. My name's G-Sling. I'm doing my thing, and I hope you do too.